Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars two of the screen's most distinguished actors, Mr. Thomas Mitchell and Mr. Donald Crisp. They appear this evening in a play written for suspense by Robert Tallman, in which psychiatry is called upon to deal with a sick mind which has unknowingly been tempted thrice by murder. And so with the performance of Thomas Mitchell as the millionaire tycoon Edgar Lowndes and of Donald Crisp as the psychiatrist Dr. Aronson, we again hope to keep you in... Us and... Yes? There's Mr. Edgar Lowndes here to see you, Dr. Aronson. Lowndes? Lowndes? Edgar Lowndes? When did we get him for a patient? I, uh, I think you'd better talk to him, Doctor. Yes, and I think he'd have to go through the usual routine. I don't go through usual routines. I'm Edgar Lowndes. I dare say you've heard the name before, Doctor. And who hasn't? Edgar Lowndes, the railroad magnet? Sit down, sir. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm a man of a few words, Doctor. Frankly, I'm at my wit's end. Why, if my business associates had any idea I was consulting a psychoanalyst, I'd be lapped off the floor of the stock exchange. But we'll never mind that. It's these headaches, Doctor, I've been having. And aspirin, codeine, nothing seems to help. How long has this been going on? A little over a month. Since the death of my wife, in fact. We were very attached, you know. Very attached. Her death was a shock to you? No, I wouldn't say a shock precisely. She's been an invalid for years. Bad heart wasn't so much what happened the night she died, but the way it happened. Oh, but why shoot off my mouth to you about it? I've told the story a thousand times till everybody's sick of hearing it. Well, perhaps you haven't told all the story, even yet. Well, as a matter of fact, that's the truth, Doctor. There's one little thing I left out, but the funny part of that is I didn't know it myself till yesterday. And what was that? Well, I was dressing for dinner. I was getting ready to go out when in comes my wife's servant. You know, her nurse. She's all a flutter about something. Mr. Lowndes, Lowndes, I hope you'll forgive me for bursting in like this, but Mrs. Lowndes... Yes, yes, speak Well, she's resting quite well, Mr. Lowndes, but she did have that little attack this afternoon, and I can't be here this evening, and what with the servant's night out being tonight, I thought... Yes, you thought I'd better stay with her, and I certainly will. Now you just go along about your business. I look after Mrs. Lowndes, personally. Oh, I knew you'd see it that way. You're a good, considerate man, Mr. Lowndes. Edgar. Feeling a little rocky, darling? Well, old Edgar's not going to let you down, not even if it means losing that war contract. Oh. I'm going to sit right here with you, sweetheart, and Lowndes, Reed, and company can go hang. Oh, no, Edgar. There's no reason for you to stay, really. There isn't. I... Just the same, I'm going to stay right here with my little wife this evening. Really, Edgar, it, it, it's not necessary. If you'll just get the brown bottle out of the medicine chest, the digitalis, and, and leave it here by my bed with a glass of water... And leave you here alone in this big house feeling the way you do? Not much. Not for a hundred war contracts. Now, Edgar, do as I say. Just leave the medicine here by my bed and everything will be all right. Now, go on, darling, and do as I say. Please, it's the brown bottle. Now, Dr. Aronson, what would you have done under the circumstances? After all, I'd left her alone before and nothing had happened. And this dinner was important in a business way. That night was my big chance. Your big chance? Yes, I suppose it was. Well, to make a long story short, she died while I was out. Now, if only I'd stayed with her. That's what I kept telling myself. And people I told the story to kept telling me that I shouldn't reproach myself. After all, it could have happened to anyone. And then yesterday... Yesterday, I was packing up her things, and I came across this bottle in the med- medicine cabinet. It was the digitalis. I'd left the wrong bottle by her bedside. That was what drove me nearly crazy, Doctor, finding that bottle. It was bad enough leaving her alone, but making a blunder like that on the medicine, 
why it made me feel almost like I... You know, I'd, I'd murdered her. But as you say, it was your big chance. Huh? What do you mean? Uh, what are you trying to tell me? You mean you think I wanted to get rid of her? You say that, Mr. Lawrence. I didn't. But I see our time is up. I can't talk to you anymore today. Oh, but you've got to. You can't leave me up in the air like this. Why, well, you've practically accused me of wanting to murder my wife. Perhaps we'll understand your feelings towards your wife better, Mr. Lowndes, when we've discussed uh, the others. What others? Hey, what are you trying to give me? Relief, Mr. Lowndes, for those headaches of yours. Tonight, for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Mr. Thomas Mitchell and Mr. Donald Crisp, whom you have heard in the first act of Case History on Edgar Lowndes. Tonight's tale of suspense. Far from the scene we've just left, far to the south, across the equator, is another scene I ask you to visit with me. It's just before the dinner hour on the beautiful roof terrace cafe of the Hotel Metropolitano of Guayaquil, Ecuador. We're finishing our appetizers, an excellent sherry, and lifting your glass, you remark to our host that you envy him such wine. He laughs. You're very kind, he says, but I'm afraid the compliment is misdirected. It is your own California you must praise for this splendid wine. And then he holds the bottle up, and looking at the label, you see Roma California Sherry. This could easily happen in many far countries where discerning tastes have found Roma wines a luxury imported and treasured. For these are, in every sense, fine wines, excellent in flavor and character, from the rich vineyard country of California. Products of age-old skills in winemaking, aided by modern scientific quality controls and tests. And here in the United States, Roma wines cost astonishingly little, mere pennies a glassful, because... Here, there is no import duty to pay, no overseas shipping costs. Such enjoyable flavor and quality, such low cost, such high wine value, have won tremendous popularity for Roma wines. They are by far America's largest selling wines, enjoyed by millions with meals when entertaining any time. To enjoy these delights yourself, ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. <coughs> And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Donald Crisp as Dr. Aronson and Thomas Mitchell in the title role of Case History on Edgar Lowndes. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. He's outside now, Doctor. Here are your notes on the case. Oh, good. Just leave them here on the desk. And, oh, Miss Finchley. Yes, Doctor? From now on, when Mr. Lowndes is in the consultation room, I want you to keep an eye on my private office. Make sure that the recording equipment is in operation at all times. I want a record of every word he says in his own voice. Is this a criminal case, Dr. Aronson? I don't know yet. But hadn't you ought to... I'm sorry, Doctor. You can let him come now, if you will, Miss Finchley. Yes, Dr. Aronson. The doctor will see you now, Mr. Lowndes. Thank you. Well, well, here I am again. Surprised to see me? How are the headaches, Mr. Lowndes? Well, sir, they evaporated just like that. I slept like a top. Don't know how you did it, but you've sold me on this psychiatry deal. So I thought while we were at it, doctor, I might as well straighten out a couple of other little things that have been worrying me. I rather thought there were uh, others. Ha, <laughs> ha, now, now, listen, doctor, don't start talking in riddles again. Maybe you were right. Maybe I did want my wife to die. Unconsciously, of course. Well, why not? She'd been an invalid for years, always complaining, never really getting anything out of life. Yes, sir. After I left your office yesterday, I thought the whole thing over, and I said to myself, Edgar Lowndes, you look at this thing squarely. Maybe you killed her. Maybe leaving the wrong medicine by her bed that night was not so much of an accident as you think it was. So what? You did her a favor. You did yourself a favor. She never really loved you anyway. If Jim Bascom... Who's hadn't... Jim Bascom? Why, uh, he died in a railroad accident. We were brakemen together on the old nickel plate road. Jim and me were like twins. 
room together, work together, like the same thing, even fell in love with the same girl. Why, I remember the night it happened. We were leaving on the fifth floor. <laughs> Better climb on top, Ed. Our signal. Hey, wait a minute, Jim. That's Virginia. Ah, oh, bless her heart. I knew she'd come to see us. Oh, hurry up, sweetheart. Oh, dear God. I was afraid I'd be too late. <laughs> That's not a training to hold a plate line you wouldn't hold up for us, Virginia. Oh, Jim. Baby. Hey, what about a kiss for me, too? Why, Edgar, you're jealous, I do believe. Well, why not? Oh, there. How's that? Like my own sister. Ah, oh, come on, Ed. Uh, You've got to tell him this time. You hear me, Jim? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell him. I promise, Virginia. Hey, come on, Jim. Come in, Ed. Come in. One more kiss, baby. Oh, darling. My darling, take care of yourself, Jim. I will, baby. Don't forget to send out the invitation. I knew when I saw him kiss her like that, it was all up for me with Virginia. Jim told me when we were crossing the divide... He and Virginia were going to be married the minute they got back to Milwaukee. We were carrying an extra heavy load, that haul. And when we started down the pass... Ed, for the Lord's sake, watch me close. Don't turn your wheel till you see me turn mine. One jolt away, this train's rolling down the grade, and we'll all land in the ravine. Sure, Jim. Don't worry. I've got to be in good shape for that wagon, remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember. I watched him walk back along the cars. It was pretty dark. And I had a cinder in my eyes since we left Salida. I thought I saw him reach the brake wheel on the other car and signal to me. I grabbed the wheel in front of me and braked my car with all the strength of my body. Three of the car behind. The coupling on Jim's car had broken. The, the light changed as we crossed the switch. And the runaway cars raced out at a dead end spur. I saw Jim's body jolt free of the splintering car and hurtle out over the gorge. Just then we plunged into a tunnel. I never found Jim's body. Well, so you can see why I think of trains in connection with death, can't you, Doctor? Yes. Yes, the association is quite clear. Uh Uh-huh. Now, you're thinking I killed Jim, too, aren't you? Isn't that what you're thinking? Is that what you're thinking, Mr. Lowndes? I don't know what to think. Say, what are you trying to do to me, anyway? I came here to get professional advice. You're trying to drive me crazy. If that's the way you feel, perhaps you'd better try another doctor. I will. By George, I will. That's just what I'll do. Well, good luck, Mr. Lowndes. Huh? Uh, No hard feelings? No, of course not. And you won't tell anybody about... about... uh, uh... Why, what is it, Mr. Lowndes? You're trembling. There it is again. It's happening again, Doctor. Say, Doctor, you've got to help me. You've got to. Forget what I said about getting another doctor. I need help. Mr. Doc- Lowndes, calm yourself. What is it? What's happening again? I'm hearing it again. The train. Like in the dream. Make it go away, Doctor. But I hear it too, Mr. Lowndes. Please. It's just a commuting train that passes over the bridge out there. Look out of the window. You can see it. Oh. Thank heaven. I thought the dream had... You never told me about a dream before. No, and I'm not going to. You know too much already. Yes, Mr. Lowndes, I'm afraid you're right. I know too much already. And I have kept a complete record of each interview with this patient by means of a recording machine concealed in my private office. There is no doubt that the patient has twice committed murder unconsciously, and on the day the patient stopped the analysis, 
he exhibited hysterical symptoms which were brought on by the sound of a railroad train. Yes, go on from there, Miss Finchley. New paragraph. The train is a death symbol for this man and appears to be the subject of a recurrent dream. The danger of the present situation lies in the fact that the patient's unconscious impulses have been brought to the surface without being rationalized. There is, in my opinion, a positive danger that the patient in his present condition may commit one or even more conscious murders, particularly should he take it into his head to board a railroad train. I noticed you were traveling alone, too, and I wondered if you'd like to join me in a little game of cards. Oh, well, that's a great idea. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Railroads are my line. Edgar Long's. Uh, not E.J. Long. Uh-huh. Oh, well, this is in the nature of an honor. Uh, you're something of a, a tycoon, Mr. Long. Thanks, uh, thanks. My name's Ellis Neckwear is my line. Mr. Ellis, <laughs> say, uh, I could use a couple of neckties... Got any samples with you? Oh, sure thing, Mr. Lawrence. Right here in this case. There you are, sir. Uh, take your pick. Uh, compliments of the Swallagin Cravat Company. Uh -huh. Now, this one strikes my fancy. Well, go ahead. Take it. Uh, see any others you like? Now, uh, let me think. Oh, hey, there's another tray under there. Now, just, just Say, it. hey, look. What? Out the window there. You see it? I don't see anything. You... Hey, hey, what are you doing? Come on. So oh, his line was Nickwear, was it? Yes, sir. Pardon me. Uh, but I noticed you were traveling alone, sir, and I wondered if you'd like to join me in a little game of cards. Oh. That's a good idea. Come in, come in, come in. My name's Jenkins. Cutlery's my line. Knives, scissors, and surgical instruments. What's your line? Police of five Midwestern states are on the lookout tonight for the homicidal maniac who stalked the corridors of the Lightning Express transcontinental luxury train, claiming the total of three victims murdered in cold blood. Edgar J. Lowndes, an executive of the railroad who was aboard the train on the fatal night, has posted a personal reward of $50,000 to anyone giving information leading to the arrest of the murderer. Well, it's happened. There was nothing you could have done to prevent it, Doctor. Even if you'd sent your report to the police, there wasn't enough evidence. And there still isn't enough evidence. Well, you run along. I'm going to stay here and finish these reports in longhand. You can type them in the morning. You're sure you don't need me? Absolutely. I think I'll take your advice. Good night, Doctor. Good night. Oh, Miss Finchley. I almost forgot to tell you... Oh, she's gone. What a nuisance. Talking yeah. to yourself, Doctor? Lowndes. How did you get in here? The door was unlocked. Would you rather I come back during office hours? Why, why, yes, yes. I'd rather you did, Mr. Lowndes, uh... Was it very urgent? It's the headaches, Doctor. They've come back. It started again about a week ago. Well, well, that's after what happened on the train. Doctor, tell me the truth. Did I commit those murders or didn't I? You're the only one who knows the answer to that. Something to do with the dream, I think. Oh, yes, the dream. We were getting around to that when you left here the last time. Now, tell me about it. Well, I hear the sound of the train... And I'm sitting there beside someone, a stranger, I think. He's wearing a checked waistcoat, and there's a there's a heavy gold watch chain with an elk's tooth suspended from it, like like the one my father used to wear when I was a child in Wisconsin. And Tell me something about your father. He died when I was quite young. He'd been an invalid doctor ever since I could remember. He used to sit in an armchair, in a wheelchair it was, really, in front of the parlor window. He looked out into the street hour after hour. Sometimes when I came running into the house, he'd put out his cane and trip me, and I hated him for that. At one time, Doctor, I... I think I was about eight or nine years old at the time. Edgar? 
Edgar, come in here this instant. Your father wants to talk to you. Oh, heck, Mother, I was going to get up a ball game. Now, the ball game can wait. You come along with me. Can I ever have any fun, Mother? Can I? Hush up. Here he is, Jonathan. Mm. Come closer, boy. Want to have a look at you? Yes, Father. Mm. Just as I thought. Grass stains all over the new suit I bought for you, huh? Where? There. Oh, and there. And there. And there. And there. And there. And there. No. I won't have him get the idea just because his father's an invalid. He can roll in the dirt like a gutter snipe and get away with it. Stop blubbering. Now go wash your face. I'm driving into town today. I want you to go along, run errands. The car my father drove was an old electric, a battery job. His legs were completely paralyzed, and my mother had to practically lift him into it. But the car itself was entirely controlled by hand driving it gave him a sense of power he needed. I used to dread those trips into town with him, the horrible spectacle of mother helping him in and out of the car while the neighbors stared, and then riding along with him alone without anyone, nothing to intervene for me. That was the worst. Ma, speak up, boy. Why don't you say something? Cat got your tongue? No, sir. I don't know why I had to raise a boy like you. You don't even keep me company on these trips into town. Poor helpless invalid, your own father. I'm sorry, sir. You're sorry. I think I'll give you another canine when we get home. Just to make good and sure you're sorry, huh? What do you say to that? Oh, bother. Now look what's happened. Stalled. Battery's run down again. Get out and open the hood in the back, boy. You see a switch there. Turn it to the left where it says uh, reserve battery. Hurry up. We're stopped right on the railroad track. Turn the switch to the left where it says reserve battery. Yeah, yes. Hurry up. There's a train will be along here any minute. Oh, yes, Father. Don't just stand there looking stupid. Go and turn the switch, as I told you. What's the matter with you? Have you gone crazy? Don't you hear the train coming, Edgar? Edgar, you want your father to be killed? I can't get out of here by myself, Edgar. Now, please do as I say. No, the train can kill you for all I care. I'm going back home. Then don't you understand what you're doing? You're, you're murdering your own father. Now, this, this is murder. Murder, I tell you, murder. Murder. home with those words of his ringing in my ears. I can hear him yelling yet. Don't, don't you understand what you're doing. You're murdering your own father. Murder. It's murder, I tell you. It's murder. Murder. But I never felt a qualm. Those words were like sweet music to me, Doctor. Well, that's the end of the story. But it's only the beginning. When I walked into this office for the first time, I was a man suffering from headaches, seemingly brought on by grief over the death of a loved one. Now I see myself as a man who murdered his father, his best friend, and his wife, who must kill and kill again, because every time I kill, I'm killing him, my father, whom I hated beyond all comprehension, and for whom one death agony was not enough. Now that you know all about these things, my dear doctor, I'm afraid that you'll have to be the next on my list. Put that gun away, Edgar. You don't really want to kill me. I'd be a fool if I didn't. Well, the headaches will come back, Edgar. There'll be no one here to cure them. They won't come back. You showed me what caused them, didn't you, doctor? You'll have worse things than headaches. You'll begin to hear things. You'll have delusions. You'll think you can hear a train passing outside at this very moment, don't you? But if you look out of the window, you'll see there's no train there at all. You won't trick me into turning my back. Come out from behind that desk. Keep your hands up high. That's it. Now then. What's that? Don't you understand what you're doing? Where's that voice coming from? <laughs> you're murdering your own father. There it is again. It's murder, I tell you. Murder. Stop it. Murder. Stop it! Stop it! I hear no voice. Stop it! I can't stand 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 it! I
dead and I'll kill myself. Then give me the gun, Edgar. Please, doctor, make it stop. Take it away. Hold it here. Make it stop. That's enough, Miss Finchley. Shut it off. Are you all right, Dr. Aronson? Yes, thank you. You almost had me thinking I was hearing voices. Well, I did hear voices, and that's why I came back. And I remembered about you wanting Mr. Lowndes' interviews recorded. So I went in the other room and started the machine. When he became violent, I played back the last part of the record, thinking it might divert his attention. Good girl. We've got all the evidence we need now to put Mr. Lowndes where he can't do any more harm. You may have evidence, but you haven't got me, and you won't get me alive. Dr. Anderson, the window! Stop him! Sorry, doctor. I can't wait. I've got to catch a train. Hey, Jim! Wait for me! Twenty-one floors to the street. Or is it twenty? Do they step thirteen in this building? Well, it doesn't matter to Lance. He's back with his friend Jim Baskin on the old nickel plate line. Listen. It's just crossing the divide. So closes Case History on Edgar Lowndes, starring Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. To every woman listening tonight, I want to say a special word about making every dinner or supper you serve taste better. I want to urge you to start serving Roma wine with your meals. It's simple. The cost is very, very little. And it works magic in making food more enjoyable. You can serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you enjoy most of all. Try hearty red Roma California Burgundy or the delicately delicious Roma California Sauternes. The cost is mere pennies a glass full. But you'll find even a pickup supper tastes like a banquet. Get Roma wines today, and if your dealer is temporarily out of them, please try again soon. Just ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Donald Crisp, and I'm sure I speak for both Mr. Mitchell and myself in saying how much we've enjoyed appearing this evening as the guests of Suspense which I'm sure must be one of your favorite programs, as it is one of ours. Next week's stars of suspense will be Geraldine Fitzgerald and Richard Wharf, who appear in one of the most extraordinary stories by that most extraordinary writer, James Thurber. Thomas Mitchell will next be seen in the 20th Century Fox production of Wilson. Donald Crisp will be seen in the coming Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, National Velvet. Next Monday, same time, you will hear Geraldine Fitzgerald and Richard Worf in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wine. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The following message from our United States Treasury is brought to you by Roma Wines. The invasion is on the biggest in history. And it needs backing that is equally big. So back the attack. Buy war bonds. Buy more than before.
the Columbia Broadcasting System.